Thanks for uh, joining today. Before we get started into a kind of serious topic, please make sure that you have uh, liked and subscribed to the platforms. It's going to help us out with the algorithms. And we very much appreciate all of the help that you might be willing to offer. Links are in the uh, caption for the episode, the episode notes. If you wish to look at what we produce on the YouTube channel in Substack, as well as the quick takes on threads and on Instagram. And for those of you who are facing any of the health issues that we're going to talk about or know anybody who is facing those issues, I've placed links into the episode notes or support groups that you can reach out to. With that announcement out of the way, let's go ahead and let's uh, talk about uh, today's topic. Today's topic is going to delve into one of the more serious discussions that we can have here on the podcast, and we're going to discuss cancers today. And what is cancer? What can we do in order to prevent cancer? What can we do if we happen to get cancer? Because we hear a lot about foods that are not safe to eat. We hear a lot about needing to be aware of environmental toxins. We need to be aware of staying away from people who smoke. And for those of us who are certain ages, uh, not standing too close to the microwave. And it's all based off of the idea that all of those things are going to somehow cause cancers. And so let's talk a little bit about cancer, how a lifestyle might lead to cancer, prevent cancer, and in some cases help with the treatments that we have for treating cancers. So let's talk about that. Warning. The following presentation contains information that might contradict what you have previously heard or believed to be true about how the human body works and contains material that is not suitable for closed-minded individuals. Enjoy. Most of us know someone, have known someone, or will know someone who has cancer, or has battled cancer, or has survived cancer. Cancer diagnosis tends to be one of the quote-unquote scarier diagnoses that we have within the medical field. And the principal reason for that is because for a long period of time, we did not have effective treatments for cancers, particularly specific types of cancers that people might face. Cancer tends to be a non-discriminatory disease. It doesn't tend to pick on specific type of people. It doesn't tend to pick on specific type of genders. It does not tend to pick on specific types of socioeconomic. The general classifications that we have when we start to separate out within society, who is susceptible for diseases and who is not susceptible for diseases. Cancers fit into a group of diseases referenced as a non-communicable disease, which means it's a disease that cannot be passed from individuals to individuals, even though we might see cancers more prevalent in certain families and in certain family members or within extended families relative to other families, or we might see it more prevalent within certain areas of the environment relative to other areas of the environment. But what is cancer? What is the actual root cause of the non-communicable disease that we're looking at here? So cancer is simply just uh, any type of abnormal cellular growth. That is where we have cells that should be replicating at specific times and specific speeds that are replicating at abnormal times and at abnormal speeds, where we're getting irregular cell growth, irregular cell masses, these irregular cell growths and irregular cell masses come about due to changes within the genetic regulation of the cell based off of changes in the cell cycle. And so before we get into discussing cancers, I think it's going to be important for us to step back and do a little reviewing of our biology, looking at the concept of the cell cycle and how disruptions in the cell cycle will lead to a lot of the issues that we look at when we start talking about cancer. The way I like to think about in terms of the cell cycle is basically a two-step process. Step one is just the cell doing whatever the cell needs to do in order to, in order to survive. I can think of this kind of like a machinery type of situation, and we usually reference it as the genetic machinery. That is, how does the cell take all of the stresses being placed on it, regulate which genes are being turned on and which genes are being turned off based off of those stresses in order to make the proteins necessary in order to survive. And so the cell is constantly trying to survive, constantly undergoing small little adaptations to the stresses that are being placed on it based off of the kind of sequence that we lay out in cell biology of the DNA will get transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA will be translated into amino acids, and then amino acids will form the proteins that we're going to be uh, using in order to combat all of the stresses either by changing the structural shape of the cell or changing the enzymes that the cell is going to be using for metabolism or changing maybe hormones that are being released by the cell. That's kind of step one, just the, the survival 
status for the cell. When the cell undergoes excessive amounts of stress, that genetic machinery gets changed slightly. And the change that comes about is through genetic regulation that triggers the necessity to provide more cells to combat the stress. Basically, it's the cells sending signals to itself that says, okay, we need more of me in order to combat this. That is what's referred to as cellular division. Scientifically, we'll call it mitosis, leading to cytokinesis, which is the formation of two new cells. This is where the cancer issue is going to come into play. The cancer issue coming into play is not going to be within specifically one of the two stages, but the two stages combined together. And what it's going to do is it's going to lead to, you could put quotes around this, haywiring of that first step leading to the second step. It's going to change the way in which we internally regulate whether or not the cell needs to replicate itself. This is where we have various types of stresses, various types of signals that can impact that genetic regulation. When we look at this in terms of genetics, we will sometimes reference genes that cause cancers as oncogenes. The oncogenes are regulatory genes that are going to impact both when am I going to divide and how quickly am I going to divide. Part of this is also going to lead to changes in signals coming away from the cells that's going to change the environment around the dividing cell mass, around the cancer mass, to lead to more signals coming to the cell, more nutrients coming to the cell, to allow for greater rates of replication to take place and a larger mass to occur, meaning that we're going to get more cells within that small little area. And so that's basically what we're looking at. We're looking at how cancers are going to come about from that cell life cycle in terms of that two-step. I'm going to do what I normally need to do in order to survive, and then I'm going to replicate in order to make sure that I can meet the stresses that are being placed on me, the cell, in order to make sure that I'm surviving. When we undergo these replications, there are other hormones, other signals that come into play that are going to regulate when the division is taking place. Do I actually meet all the requirements for division to occur, for new cells to form? And this is the second spot that the oncogenes can come into play. And what it's going to do is it's going to change the regulation of small little intracellular hormones that we call cyclins that will disrupt the checkpoints that the cyclins have in terms of, do I meet all of the requirements in order to replicate correctly? For those of you that are listening, there's a secondary uh, publication on Substacks that's showing this video where we're looking at the cyclins and how the cyclins are inter interacting with the regulation of the cell cycle, particularly within the division process that's taking place. And so when we start looking at the oncogenes, what they're going to do is that they're going to disrupt that two-step process by speeding up the rate at which cellular divisions are, are occurring, but it's also going to change how we have blood moving into the tissues, change how we have blood vessels moving into the tissues, change the type of metabolism that's coming into play, which leads to a lot of misconceptions and misnomers and disinformation about certain types of diets that you can use in order to quote unquote prevent the cancers from forming based off of distinct types of metabolites that cancer cells will release. At the same time, there are these other factors that come into play that's going to regulate how long can a cell actually survive and how long can a cell actually replicate? And these are little proteins that are associated with the actual chromosomes, the actual DNA genes within the nucleus of the cells called telomeres. And what happens within cancer cells is that we're going to disrupt the regulation of the telomeres. Every time we undergo replication of the cell, there's going to be a small little chunk of telomere that gets cut, that gets dropped from the whole protein that's there, the whole telomere. Telomer. And basically what it's doing is it's putting a endpoint to the number of replications that can take place. And what's happening when we start having these misfirings within the cell cycles, those telomeres don't get clipped. And because those telomeres don't get clipped, what it does is it allows for not only fast replications, but excessive numbers of replications, where cells should stop replicating and undergo its normal death cycle, what we refer to as apoptosis scientifically, where the cell stops its life cycle, stops that second step of, okay, I need to divide in order to survive. When we get telomeres that are too short, 
we cannot undergo replication because it doesn't allow for the DNA to replicate itself so that the cells have the correct DNA in each cell so that the cells can survive following replication. And so when we start having these cancer growths, what ends up happening is that those, those telomeres don't get trimmed appropriately. And because they don't get trimmed appropriately, you're going to have irregular numbers of replications taking place. And so what we end up getting is we end up getting stresses that trigger changes in the cyclin regulation. But at the same time, we get stresses that cause changes in enzymes that should be clipping the telomeres that do not clip the telomeres. And so what ends up happening is that, as we talked about with, with stresses, where stresses cause excessive clipping of telomeres that lead to uh, early death of tissues, in particular looking at neurons and neurodegenerative diseases, where because of the amount of stress, the amount of ROS damage that takes place, you end up getting telomeres being clipped, excessively clipped, that limits the replication processes that occur and the regulation processes that occur within cells like with degenerative diseases, neurodegeneration diseases have been shown to have telomere issues. Uh, osteoporosis has been shown to have telomere issues, uh, particularly osteopenic osteoporosis. Sarcopenia has been shown to have telomere issues within skeletal muscles. A lot of the degenerative diseases come about because the telomeres get clipped too quickly and don't allow for appropriate replication to take place. And so we have these two factors that come into play as it relates to the cell cycle issues that lead to cancers. Now, when we start looking at the cell cycle issues that lead to cancers, we also have to take a look at, okay, what cells are going to be more likely to have replication issues that will lead to the development of cancers? And there are certain cells within our body that are stuck in that first step of the cell cycle, where I'm simply going to be responding to the various stresses that are taking place by triggering new RNA to be formed, to trigger new proteins to be formed, to change my structural shape, to change the hormones that are being released, or in the case of neurons, the neurotransmitters that are being released, to meet the demands that are being placed on it. In this case here, we have certain types of cells that we will not see high rates of replication of the cells that are more reliant upon stem cells to lead to new cells as opposed to replication of existing cells. These are cells like the neurons, cells like skeletal muscle, cells like cardiac muscle that do not have replications taking place at a regular basis off of the cells that are already there. They, they utilize stem cells when stem cells are available to replace the cells if they need to be replaced. Whereas cells like skin cells, cells of the intestine, cells of the esophagus, cells in the lungs, cells in uh, your mouth are undergoing rapid rates of replication in order to ensure that those barriers, those structures, are intact based off of the amount of stresses that they're being exposed to from the environment that we are living in or the environment that we expose them to based off of things that we allow to be exposed to our body by selecting the type of environmental stresses that we place on them. And so we have those two factors. And so, well, then someone might say, well, I have brain cancer, or I know someone has brain cancer. You're telling me that it's not the neurons? Isn't the neurons what's making up the brain? And yeah, neurons are making up the brain. But the principal cells that we actually see in the brain are not neurons, even though there's a, a lot of neurons that are there. There are more support cells than there are neuron cells. And it's those support cells, what we refer to as glial cells, that are actually going to be doing the replications that form those brain cancers. It's not the neurons. Even though we might see neurons entrapped within those cancerous growths, it's not the neurons themselves that are becoming cancerous. It's actually the, the glial cells that are becoming cancerous. And the type of brain cancer that we have is going, to is going to be dictated by what type of glial cell is having abnormal growths. But at the same time, you say, well, you say that skeletal muscle doesn't grow, but you can have skeletal muscle cancers. Most of those cancers are actually coming from the what are referred to as the satellite cells or the stem cells of the skeletal muscle that undergo in, inappropriate or irregular growths. And so let's go ahead and let's do, delve into how the stuff that we do, the stuff that we expose ourselves to, the stuff that we eat, how do those impact the oncogenes, without getting into the specific oncogenes, because the specific oncogenes is going to dictate what type of cell that we're looking at, how do 
the lifestyles that we lead, the environment that we get exposed to, how do those impact the oncogenes and the regulation of the telomeres and the regulation of the cyclins that's going to impact whether or not cancers will grow or not? Even if we happen to have the various oncogenes or the proto-oncogenes that might actually cause cancers to grow. The most famous of these or the most well-known of these are like the HER2 gene that is usually associated with breast cancer, the BRCA gene also associated with breast cancer, the CMYC gene associated with types of lymphoma, the BCR gene associated with leukemia, particularly B-cell leukemia, the EGFR gene associated with types of lung cancer, the NMYC gene associated with both uh, uh, neuroblastomal cancers as well as lung cancers. Those are the oncogenes and the proto-oncogenes that we talk about when we talk about oncogenes. And so what types of things can we do? What types of things might we expose ourselves to that can lead to the expression of the oncogenes or the conversion of a proto-oncogene, an inactive or a pre-gene expression, to the actual oncogene expression? And so when we start looking at this idea about the, the genes being turned on, turned off, this is where we have to go back once again into a biological concept. And that biological concept that gets kind of misrepresented when we start looking at our biology that we get taught in high school and in some cases in undergraduate uh, biology courses in college is off of this Mendelian idea about genes, where if I happen to have a gene, I'm automatically going to express that gene what we refer to as genotype leads to phenotype. But what we understand is that the genes are actually going to have various types of regulation and regulatory factors that are going to impact whether or not that gene actually gets expressed. This is where when we start looking at genetic expression, just because I have a gene doesn't mean I'm going to express that gene because of the regulations that take place, either through genetic regulation or epigenetic regulation, through those two types of regulatory factors. I can either silence a gene or overexpress a gene by turning that gene on or turning that gene off, either permanently or for prolonged periods of time. And through that switch, through that turning on, turning off, I'm able to regulate the expression of the gene. And by regulating the expression of the gene, I'm able to regulate whether or not I'm actually going to show the trait for that gene, which means that just because I have that oncogene or I have a parent that's had cancer or a parent that is currently fighting cancer doesn't necessarily mean that I'm automatically going to express that same cancer simply because of the genetic components within the cancer. Just because I have that gene doesn't mean I'm going to express that gene unless I actually have this, the triggers to turn on or turn off that gene. In this case, here we're talking about the oncogene. Am I gonna, going to express the gene that's going to cause dysregulation to the cyclins or dysregulation to the enzymes that are supposed to be shortening the telomeres with each successive replications taking place? And this is where we get into a lot of misconceptions, misnomers, misinformation, disinformation as to what things are safe, put quotes around that, to be exposed to, and what things are not safe, once again, put quotes around that, to be exposed to. And this is going to lead back to something that we looked at earlier in terms of endocrine disrupting issues and metabolic disrupting issues. Because in order to have this effect on the genes, we either have to have a metabolic dysregulation, an endocrine dysregulation, or a combination of the two that's going to lead to one of two outcomes. Either a mutagenic outcome, that's where I'm going to cause the mutation to take place within the genes or a carcinogenic effect, this is where I'm going to trigger irregular cell cycling that's going to allow for cancerous growth to develop. And so we end up having two, two distinct features that come into play that's going to lead to this change in regulation. Is it a mutagenic or is it a carcinogenic? Just because I'm one doesn't mean I'm not the other. Just because I'm a mutagenic doesn't mean I'm, also, I'm not going to be a carcinogenic. Just because I'm carcinogenic doesn't mean I'm not going to be a mutagenic. It's what and how are the disruptions coming into play? Is it going to be a disruption in terms of the genetic sequence, what the actual DNA happens to be? That's the mutagenic. Or is it going to be a disruption in terms of the cell cycling? That's the carcinogenic. And before we get into the various lists of the different types of chemicals and different types of environmental stresses that might cause cancer, we have to discuss this in terms of a relative risk issue. That is... Um, What's the likelihood of causing cancer simply because of exposure to the various substances? 
And this is where we uh, get into that misinformation, disinformation aspect of this, where we get an indication from research that there might be a uh, 1%, 2% elevation of risk for developing cancer. And then it gets uh, reported within the news streams and within social media feeds as this substance causes cancer. And it's more about uh, exposure and exposure time and exposure duration. So whenever we look at these substances, it's not about a single episode. It's about a cumulative episode. And based off of the cumulative episode, we might see an elevated relative risk for developing cancers. And we talk about this this developing relative risk. What we're talking about is what's the likelihood of having a cancer develop simply due to exposure and overexposure to the substance relative to having no exposure to the substance. And a lot of times, some of the studies are coming, coming out of cellular studies. Sometimes we get some epidemiology studies that lead into the development of relative risks. And uh, another type of looking at this relative risk is also odds ratio. That is, what's the odds of developing cancers from exposure? And so when we start looking at this list, just because you have exposure to that substance or just because you have uh, exposure to that thing within the environment is not an automatic guarantee that you're going to have some sort of either mutagenic effect or carcinogenic effect, or you're going to have some sort of uh, change in regulation of the cyclins or of the enzymes regulating the telomeres through the various uh, stimulations of the oncogenes. And so when we're talking about these uh, carcinogenic and mutagenic uh, agents, what we're really looking at is we're looking at how does the exposure to these substances alter the genetic regulations that can lead to either mutations within the DNA that can lead to a cancer formation or a change in epigenetic or genetic regulation that can lead to a cancer formation. And once again, just because you have exposure to these substances does not mean you're going to develop cancer. It's about a dose duration episode. The more you get exposed to the substance, the higher likelihood you can have for developing cancers. But just because you're exposed to it, just because you have prolonged exposure to it, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to develop uh, the cancers. The other thing that's worth noting right now before we get into a lot of the the big points of the discussion is that we're looking at what's referred to as a multifactorial issue. That is, there are multiple factors that come into play that will lead to expression of the oncogenes where we'll pinpoint one factor or another factor as being like the culprit. But in reality, because we have multiple factors come into play for almost every non-communicable disease, It's difficult to say that it is a single thing that is going to be the root cause for the development of any of the specific cancers that we're going to discuss. And we start looking at specific types of chemicals or specific types of environmental stresses. We have to remember is that there are factors that come into play beyond just the fact that we have a multifactorial episode taking place in the non-chemical disease. We have to remember it's along the lines of toxicity in terms of exposure. Because once again, it's about dose duration as well as exposure within that dose and duration. And it goes kind of into the same kind of talk when we look at things that are toxic and things that are poisonous to us in terms of whether or not we reach the threshold for having uh, a dose duration that will cause the issues to come about. And so if we start looking at things within the environment, there's a lot of uh, popular press, there's a lot of news reports out there about ultra processed foods. And this is where a lot of people will harp on, oh, you need to eat raw or you need to eat organic or you need to eat uh, things that you only make at home. But that's not necessarily what the science is saying in terms of the ultra processed foods. There is a, a increased relative risk of between two and 10% for developing metabolic issues from consumption of ultra processed foods where there's an indication that uh, for about every 10% increase in total consumption of ultra-processed foods within the accumulation of your diet, we see about a 2% increase in relative risk for any type of cancer to develop. That percentage changes when we start looking at uh, distinct types of reproductive cancers, 
there is indication that we see somewhere in uh, the neighborhood of that 10% increase of overall consumption, leading to almost a 20% increase in uh, ovarian cancer uh, development, about a 15, 16% increase in breast cancer development, all based off of the uh, amount of uh, ultra processed foods that's being consumed. Most of those reproductive cancers are coming about due to the metabolic dysregulation that comes about from the ultra-processed foods as it relates to hyperadiposity, overfatness, and the impact that overfatness has on the development of distinct types of cancers, in particular reproductive cancers, through dysregulation of reproductive regulatory hormones. Disruptions that can lead to reproductive cancers, even if the person is no longer overfat, Due to the long-term impact that overfatness has on dysregulation of reproductive hormones, including the hormones that are going to be regulating normal reproductive functions. There is an indication that we have an increased relative risk over uh, multiple years, multiple decades from consumption of ultra-processed foods, but most of those uh, indications are related to the impacts that ultra-processed foods have on metabolic dysregulation and the impact that metabolic dysregulation has on overfatness and the impact that overfatness has on development of certain types of cancers. Just because we have this indi- indicated increased relative risk coming from consumption of, of ultra-processed foods does not mean you should be avoiding ultra-processed foods or that you should avoid ultra-processed foods altogether because eating other foods that we might think as being healthier than the ultra-processed foods can also have mutagenic effects, can also have carcinogenic effects. There are chemicals that are found within plants for those people who think, oh, if I eat vegan or if I eat vegetarian, I'm going to basically stop the likelihood of me developing cancers. There are chemicals within plants, whether they are cooked plants or not cooked plants, whether we're eating the the plant material raw or not, that is known to have a mutagenic effect. These are sometimes referred to as flavonoids. And yes, there are flavonoids that we talk about as being very potentially beneficial flavonoids. But then there's also types of flavonoids that uh, can cause or have been shown to cause cancers. These are the mutagenic flavonoids, such as uh, cortisone, camperfol, which has been shown to have distinct types of cancerous growth within distinct types of models. Whether it's the same that we see within uh, humans is a whole other story, but we do see them within animal models. We do see some of the uh, acidic chemicals coming out, acidic uh, flavonoids that we see within things that we would normally consider to be beneficial for us in terms of coming away from plants. Uh, that could cause cancers to grow. Sometimes we'll see uh, flavonoids that are known to be mutagenics, that are known to be carcinogenics in products like teas and coffees, cocoa, wine, beer, all of which have, once again, based off of the dose duration, can lead to mutagenic and carcinogenic potentials for for humans, particularly with increased uh, consumption, increased exposure. Now, the other thing comes about from those flavonoids and from consumption of those substances is secondary metabolic effects that take place within the body. And those secondary metabolic processes that take place within the body can develop metabolites that also have carcinogenic effects, such as, such as aldolation that could take place, particularly when we start looking at alcohol. And one of the reasons why alcohol can lead to, and particularly ex- excessive consumption of alcohol, can lead to uh, cancer formations is from the uh, processing that takes place from both the microbiome within the intestines as well as within the liver in terms of the detoxification reactions taking place that form an aldehyde group. And the aldehyde groups can cause and have been shown to cause uh, cancers and are carcinogenic through their mutagenic processes. We also have some uh, mutagenic effects coming away from certain types of uh, menthols in terms of the extractions that come about from the chemical processing forming the menthol compounds. We also have to worry about uh, within food products that we would normally consider to be healthy if we happen to be cooking at home, 
things that come about through the cooking process, particularly cooking process as it relates to meat, but we also see the cooking process as it relates to vegetables based off of the heating of proteins as well as carbohydrates in the foods that we're cooking. And this is where we, we get the PAHs, the PAHs, the polycyclic aromic hydrocarbons. This is where we have to worry about things like, like benzopyrenes being formed. A lot of the PAHs and the benzopyrenes that we look at are really looking at in terms of uh, a process known as uh, pyrolyzing. That is the effect that heat has on the structure of the chemical, in particular the heat causing changes within the amino acid structures and the heat causing changes within the amino acid structures causing uh, the increased relative risk for cancer formations this is where uh, processed meats sometimes gets a bad rap. This is where cooked uh, red meat sometimes gets a, a bad rap in terms of the exposure of the meat to high temperature as well as to smoke, particularly if we're looking at doing any type of barbecuing or grilling of the meat. Where if uh, research has indicated if you can lessen the uh, combination of animal fat droplets onto the fire, you can limit some of the pyrolization taking place to some of the amino acids within the, within the food. This is where you have to sometimes worry about uh, that myelorization of food, the browning effect of food in terms of the formation of those hydrocarbons, particularly the polynucleated aromatic hydrocarbons or the aromatic hydrocarbons or the benzoids that can come about. This is where we have to worry about sometimes the food preservatives that we might see. And this is where uh, we hear about, particularly some of the soft drinks and how some soft drinks are available in the United States, but some soft drinks are not available outside the United States based off of the sodium benzoids that are used as preservatives. And that's because the, the benzoids are known to have carcinogenic, mutagenic effects, particularly in high concentrations because of the impact that it has in terms of being a metabolic and endocrine disruptor. But then you say, oh, I'm going to avoid the, the sodas that have the preservatives. I'm going to avoid the red meats. I'm simply going to eat my vegetables. I'm going to go vegan vegetarian because that's the healthiest thing for me to do, supposedly. That's going to help prevent cancers from forming. But those same uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, those same benzoids can be seen in plants based off of the plants picking up those chemicals from the outside environment due to exposure to fertilizers, due to exposure to pesticides. Even if you want to think about, oh, I'm going to be eating quote unquote organic and organic is, and once again, I highly recommend listening to the talk that I put out there in terms of organic foods and the misconception about organic foods and what it's really looking at in terms of the organic versus the non-organic. It's, it's more of a labeling thing and it's about how much exposure does that plant get to certain types of fertilizer, certain types of pesticides. But it's not where we're actually having this, oh, it's growing naturally as if it's growing in the wild. And even if it's growing naturally and growing, into, growing in the wild, it's still being exposed to all of the chemicals that are being put out into the environment. Some of those chemicals, such as the uh, hydrocarbons that we might see within uh, gasolines and within petrols, within any type of petroleum product. Hydrocarbons that we see within petrol, within petroleum products are known to be carcinogenic and mutagenic. This is one of the things that we uh, started seeing when we started looking at uh, athletes that were exposed to the, art of, to the artificial turf that was the second uh, go-around with artificial turf, not the actual astroturf where it was just carpet laid on top of concrete, but where we made artificial turf that was supposed to replicate natural grass, where filler in between the artificial blades of uh, grass fibers, where it was a uh, vinyl grass, which is a hydrocarbon, that was uh, covered in and supported by a mixture of ground up tires, ground up shoe rubber, both of which are also hydrocarbons. And what we know that is when those uh, substances get hot as being exposed through to sunlight, the carcinogenic effect, the mutagenic effect of those substances become more pronounced. And so one of the things that has started to be recognized from exposure to those uh, first and second generation of the new AstroTurf is increased 
uh, cancers, particularly amongst athletes that spend excessive amounts of time on the grass or on the artificial grass in uh, exposed positions, in, in positions that would allow those uh, rubber pellets to become embedded into the skin, to break through the barrier of the skin, to be inhaled, where exposure to those hydrocarbons caused very similar effects to exposure to other types of hydrocarbons related to petroleum in terms of the uh, development of cancers. That same type of hydrocarbon effect is one of the things that we see in terms of TARS. And when we talk about TARS, we're talking about uh, uh, tobacco TARS or uh, hemp TARS. Hemp is uh, marijuana TARS. In terms of uh, respiratory cancers, whether those TARS are going to come about from uh, exposure directly to the leaf as what we would see with someone that might uh, chew the tobacco or snuff the tobacco or uh, use uh, some type of instrument to burn the tobacco or burn the hemp, where exposure to the, uh, um, the plant oils is the tarring that can come about that leads to the, uh, the cancers that are associated with smoking or chewing of tobacco or smoking of other types of plant products. And once again, it's it's from that the the plant oils from the hydrocarbons from the aromatic hydrocarbons to be specific that we see the increased relative risk for cancer developments. Once again, just because you're exposed to doesn't mean you're going to automatically develop cancers, but it's going to increase the relative risk for cancers. Along with those issues, we also see issues in terms of the mutagenic and carcinogenic effects uh, within uh, various types of substances that we might be exposed to, such as uh, the radiations that we might be exposed to, x-ray radiations, getting x-rays for medical procedures or MRIs or CT scans. Exposure to sunlight, ultraviolet radiation is, is also something that we have to be concerned about. This is why if we happen to go to the dentist and we need to uh, do x-rays of our mouth in order to uh, look for cavities, we go ahead and we do a lead covering of our uh, chest and torso so as to minimize the exposure that we have. Or if people happen to be uh, uh, radiation uh, techs, they'll wear exposures uh, badges to determine how much radiation they get exposed to so as to minimize the total dose duration that they might have as it relates to the types of radiations. Whether, whether it's X-ray, gamma, or alpha radiation. For sun exposure, this is where we have things like uh, SPF or clothing that would shield skin exposure to uh, the sunlight as it relates to the sun's uh, ionization effect on the DNA within the skin cells, as well as the uh, use of uh, melanocytes within our body and the production of melanin, the tanning effect that we see or the uh, darker skin pigmentation that we might see with extended exposure to uh, sunlight. Those are types of environmental exposures that we would also see. Uh, There's also certain types of uh, food additives that we uh, continually hear about in the news, particularly as it relates to the food dyes and the dye colorings that we might see, and its uh, increased uh, chance for uh, carcinogenic effects. This is also where we might see things like uh, in older buildings as it relates to uh, insulation, asbestos, and the effect that asbestos has in terms of being a carcinogenic agent as it relates to uh, lung cancer and respiratory cancers. This is also where we have to worry about uh, certain types of dietary supplements that we might take, especially some of the dietary supplements that have uh, purported uh, weight loss benefits to them. Some of the thermogenic agents might have uh, chemicals within them that might stimulate uh, distinct types of cancer growth. This is also where we have to worry about uh, taking uh, dietary supplements that contain antioxidants, even though we think of antioxidants as being beneficial in terms of ROS regulation and regulation of oxidative stress in the body. That is important in terms of overall stress and uh, aging effects on tissue. Excessive consumption of antioxidants is also known to uh, increase the relative risk for having cancerous growth because it does not allow for the regulation of tissue growth that would normally occur due to the oxidative stress that is associated with normal aging processes of the cells, along with dietary supplements that are uh, purported to have impacts on hormonal health, in particular phytosterols, uh, plant plant hormones that mimic the steroid hormones that we have in our body, 
along with, particularly for females, particularly females that happen to have uh, estrogen-sensitive uh, breast cancer genes, the use of hormone replacement therapy, particularly estrogen hormone replacement therapy, during uh, menopause and premenopausal time as a means to control the effects that are felt by the female during that menopausal uh, change, where uh, there is indication for uh, hormone replacement therapy to increase relative risks for developing of reproductive cancers, particularly breast cancer, particularly in the estrogen-sensitive uh, breast cancer families. But then for everybody, there's also the issues that come about in terms of the cooking, back to the cooking issues, as it relates to the uh, forever chemicals that we might uh, see within uh, some of the pots and pans, particularly in the older nonstick pots and pans that we might have within our kitchen, as it's going to increase the uh, polyfluoral uh, exposure that we might have, the forever chemical fluorides that we might have, that uh, we know that fluoride and fluoral uh, hydrocarbons and fluoral uh, chemicals have uh, known effects on terms of both mutagenic effects as well as carcinogenic effects on the human body. The other uh, substance that uh, most people will get exposed to through food and uh, intake of food, even though a lot of people are becoming more hesitant to eat these things, are the artificially dyed foods and the artificial food colorings. And we know that we, uh, red dye 40, yellow dye 5, yellow dye 6 uh, have uh, indicated increased relative risk for developing cancers through the consumption of those food dyes. But there's other ones that uh, we know might have a carcinogenic or toxic effect within humans, such as uh, red dye 40, possibly yellow dye 6. And these uh, food dyes, the artificial food dyes in particular, that we're talking about in terms of relative risks, the reason for the increased relative risk that comes about from these food dyes is due to the uh, petroleum hydrocarbon base that is used as the foundation for forming those food dyes, as opposed to the actual uh, color dye that we think about. It's the actual chemical structure within the food dye that can lead to the increased relative risk for cancers that has led to, uh, recently, within uh, the last year, banning of distinct types of foods, distinct types of food additives, and distinct types of food dyes within uh, food products. There's also the trans fats that we might see within foods that is indicated as having a potentiation for metabolic disruption and the potentiation for metabolic disruption that can lead to carcinogenic effects that has led to uh, the reduction in trans fats that we see within many of the mass marketed foods. And so that's the kind of uh, substances that have mutagenic and carcinogenic effects, whether it's physical environmental stuff or whether it's stuff that we can consume. And so those are the things that are going to cause dysregulation within the cyclins, dysregulation within the enzymes that might regulate the telomeres that can cause, car that can cause cancers to develop, that uh, can increase the relative risk for cancer development. But now the question comes into play. Okay, what happens once we worry about cancer or think we might have cancer or have to start treating cancer? And this is where we start looking at, okay, what are the big picture types of treatments that might be offered as it relates to cancer treatments. And this is where looking at what is the uh, stage of cancer. So we start, talk, start talking about stage of cancer, talking about how well developed is the cancer cells, how far along is the growth, is it contained within a single area or has it ex expanded from that single area, where if we start talking about benign cancers, those are cancers that we'll see kind of contained within a certain area, whether whether Whereas if it's malignant, we will see it have expanded from that area this is where we have to worry about distinct types of cancers in terms of its uh, ability to integrate within capillary beds, particularly lymph capillary beds, where it can spread through lymph circulation from areas of one growth to areas of other growths. This is why some cancers are more uh, deadly than other cancers. The other thing we look at when we start looking at the treatment of cancers in terms of the treatment options that we have, is what type of cancer growths are we looking at? And this is where we start looking at survivability rates within cancers. And once again, in order to go through the survivability of the cancers, we have to look at each specific cancer that's out there. And that's not the purpose of this podcast, because otherwise we'd be here for days, weeks, months uh, talking about the oncology of this oncology is the study of cancer, the actual 
types of physiology, the pathophysiology of cancer. And so we start looking at how we go about treating cancers. We'll start looking at in terms of the uh, allopathic treatments, that is the traditional medical treatments for cancers. And we'll start looking at additive or alternative treatments that we might have without getting into the quackery that is out there, even though we'll uh, touch on some of the misinformation as relates to some of the quackery in treatment options. And so when we start thinking about cancer, the biggest thing that we normally think about in terms of cancer treatments is chemotherapy. And what chemotherapy is attempting to do is it's attempting to chemically kill the cancer cells. The problem is we cannot pinpoint the chemical killing of just the cancer cells. And so one of the issues that comes about with chemotherapy is that we see uh, wasting issues of tissues that aren't cancerous because we're killing everything in the body in, in an attempt to save the body while killing the cancer. And so when we start thinking about chemotherapy, and so we start looking at chemotherapy, what we're really looking at is we're looking at ways in which we can go about removal of what's referred to as the tumor, that's the cancerous growth, by destroying the cells within that cancerous growth through chemical means. Those are, uh, that's a uh, chemical treatment that is meant to stop the cells from growing, from doing their cell cycling. So when we talk about cell growth, we talk about cancerous growth, we're not talking about the cells becoming bigger. We're talking about having more of those cells. And so when we start looking at chemotherapy, it's really looking at uh, how we go about treating that, that, that abnormal growth. And chemotherapy, everybody thinks about in terms of the uh, intravenous uh, drug drips, where the person sitting in the chemotherapy uh, unit in the hospital taking uh, an IV and having the IV drip, the cancer killing drugs into their body. But that's just one type of chemotherapy. There are uh, chemotherapy that can be done through uh, taking uh, oral medications. There are injectable chemotherapy drugs. There are uh, drugs that get implanted into uh, organs. There are some uh, topical chemotherapy treatments that the chemotherapy will be applied to the skin. But regardless of the type of chemotherapy that you're doing, one of the major side effects that chemotherapy has is the uh, wasting issues. It's one of the uh, primary side effects that we see with chemotherapy. The other thing we might see with chemotherapy uh, due to the stress that chemotherapy applies to the body is a reduction in uh, food desire. That's the wanting to eat. This is where uh, a lot of times when we start looking at uh, chemotherapy responses, uh, we will do secondary treatments in an attempt to get the person to eat large amounts of food or provide them with some sort of secondary medication that might uh, stimulate wanting to eat. This is where uh, THC has come into play in terms of secondary treatments within uh, cancer treatments as it relates to uh, improving the desire to, to eat. One of the other uh, primary types of uh, cancer treatments that we might see, particularly uh, for distinct types of uh, cancers, is radiation therapy. There are di different types of radiation therapy that's out there, but when we're looking at radiation therapy, what we're basically doing is we're attempting to basically beam a, uh, a ray of radiation into the cancer. And what this is attempting to do is this is attempting to obliterate that uh, cancer growth by uh, basically overheating the area, if you want to think about in terms of what the radiation is doing. The problem is, is that because it's radiation, we have increased relative risks for radiation uh, exposure. Radiation exposure is, or excuse me, radiation therapy is uh, seen to reduce the size of tumor growths. Radiation uh, therapy has been shown to uh, be able to, with more exactness than chemotherapy, lead to a uh, reduction in the uh, cancer. It's typically given in conjunction with other cancer treatments. The most common that we'll see in terms of cancer treatments that are associated with radiation therapy is chemotherapy, as well as the other classical uh, cancer treatment, which is surgical removal of the cancer. Surgical removal of the cancer is usually the one of the first steps in cancer treatments where they will remove, by that I mean the, the uh, surgeon, will remove the large mass of cancer cells. 
Typically, after surgery, there will be secondary uh, therapeutic interventions, particularly biomarker interventions. This is where uh, blood blood work will be taken, lymph work will be taken in attempt to assay whether uh, whether the the cancerous uh, growths are contained within single areas or have spread from that growth that was surgically removed to other areas of the body. This is where cancerous growths within areas where we have high density of lymph nodes become more prominent in terms of spread. This is where uh, reproductive cancers tend to have spread to them. Breast cancer, ovarian cancer, testicular cancer can have spread from the origin of the cancer to other areas simply because of the high density of lymph tissue within those those regions. If we start looking at, uh, back to uh, radiation, one of the things that we tend to see in terms of uh, issues that might come about from radiation is really a lot of the uh, radiation exposure issues that we might see, which include things like uh, fatigue. This is where for people who uh, undergo radiation therapy, we will see hair loss. We will see changes in skin tone. We will see changes, uh, once again, depending upon where the radiation is uh, uh, being exposed. We may see changes in uh, senses. We may see uh, changes in regulation of uh, visceral organs, once again, depending upon where we see uh, the radiation coming into play. And this is where, with the radiation therapy, we usually get the classical uh, image of the cancer patient with uh, hair loss, uh, extreme fatigue, excessive weight loss due to uh, radiation and the radiation exposure causing a change in both food regulation, very similar to what we see with chemotherapy, but also with excessive nausea, excessive vomiting that can come about from exposure to radiation. Now, with some of the uh, newer treatments, we get more uh, pinpoint ability to treat the cancers. And so one of the more newer treatments is what's referred to as immunotherapy. And so in immunotherapy, what we're really doing is we're really using the immune system, in particular uh, T cells and B cells within our immune system in order to stimulate an immune response to cells within the body that have uh, cell markers, what we call antigens, that indicate that they are cancerous. And this is where the surgeon will provide to the uh, oncology team a sample of tissues, and those sample of tissues will be cultured. The From the person with, with cancer, there will be extraction of T cells and extraction of B cells, in which uh, through exposure to the uh, cancerous uh, cells in culture, what, the, what they're able to do is they're able to, and put quotes around this, teach the T cells how to uh, become activated to that antigen marker. Those T cells will then undergo replication. They will get more of those T cells. And then the T cells that have been, quote unquote, taught how to attack the cancer cells will then be uh, injected back into the individual. This is what's referred to as a, as a T cell transfer. But then the other way that we look at this is with B cells, in which the B cells are the cells that within the immune system that's going to be producing the antibodies. And one of the things that they'll be doing in terms of the culturing is they will develop antibodies that will be specific to the antigen that is indicated as uh, being present on those cancer cells. And then what they'll do is they'll then culture those B cells. And by culturing those B cells, they'll allow the B cells to become what's referred to as plasmal, which is the B cells that are producing the antibodies. And those B cells will then be able to produce antibodies to the cancer cells. And what those antibodies do is that they'll label They'll latch onto the antigen and label the cancer cells as being foreign to the body. Those labels that say I'm foreign to the body will then activate a uh, immune response to the antibodies. Activation of T cells, activation of macrophages, and the activation of the T cells, the activation of the macrophages, the immune cells that will engulf and digest infected cells or uh, foreign agents, they will attack, put quotes on that, attack the, the cancer cells in an attempt to rid the body of the cancer cells. There has uh, been some studies that have shown that immunotherapy has been excessively effective in treating distinct types of cancers with minimal amounts of the side effects that we see associated with either chemotherapy or with um, radiation therapy. For some uh, entities that are known to cause cancers, such as uh, the hepatitis uh, viruses, 
such as uh, papillomavirus, HPV. Vaccinations against those, those viruses is known to prevent cancers from, from forming. Now you can't get the vaccine. You can't be vaccinated once those cancers have started to develop, but you can use immunotherapy to those cancers. Along with allopathic treatments, there are a host of alternative treatments that can be used as care. That is additive care to the allopathic care that we use within the medical setting. And this is where we have to be careful. This is where a lot of the quackery comes into play. One of the uh, biggest myths, mis- misconceptions, misnomers misinformation, disinformation that's out there as relates to this can't come about is that somehow there is a change in uh, pH within the body around where cancer cells grow. There is some indication that there is a change in metabolic activity and the change in metabolic activity can lead to accumulation of metabolic acids around cancer growth. However, this does not change total pH of the body. One of the quackeries that come into play as relates to that pH issue is the idea around alkaline uh, foods, alkaline water in particular in terms of consumption based off the fact that the body's pH is normally alkaline, basic. And that's true. But the problem is, is that you cannot consume materials and expect to go to specific places within the body as it's going to go into circulation and as it goes into circulation, it's going to interact with all tissues of the body, which becomes problematic because we're going to try to homeostatically regulate body pH to be slightly alkalinic. And if I'm consuming alkalinic things, the likelihood of me elevating my body's pH, that is making my pH more basic, becomes more pronounced. And while we have very good buffer systems against acids, we do not have very good buffer systems against bases, which means that becoming more alkaline is actually going to put me out of homeostatic balance more rapidly than the acidotic conditions that might come about from having cancerous growth and having those acids within those specific areas. One of the other uh, quackeries that come into play as relates to the uh, treatment of cancers is the idea about uh, use of various types of um, hyperbaric chambers the use of peroxides or basically over-oxygenating the body, ozone treatments, ozone infusions, as well as uh, a consumption of various types of herbs and quote-unquote naturopathic supplements. And just like we talked about in terms of supplements and the fact that some supplements actually have carcinogenic effects, same thing holds true with a lot of these um, ideas as relates to uh, the uh, herbal or quote unquote nat- naturopathic supplements. As it relates to the uh, hyperoxygenation or the overoxygenation of the body, once again, it goes back to that, to the misconception about the uh, cancer cells and the metabolic activity leading to the higher amounts of acids, particularly metabolic acids within uh, the area around the cancer cells. And while you might think that, oh, if I'm doing more anaerobic, that's metabolism without oxygen, then providing more oxygen is going to be more beneficial. The problem is that the reason why we see the higher anaerobic responses within the cancer cells is simply due to the rate of metabolic activity. And the rate of metabolic, metabolic activity is actually stimulating blood cell, uh, excuse me, blood vessel growth into the area as well as additional blood cells. And simply doing this oxygenation issues is not going to alleviate that metabolic condition. Other quackeries that come into play is this idea that since sharks don't uh, get cancers, which is not true, that consuming of shark tissues, in particular shark cartilage, is somehow going to be a either preventative measure or a therapeutic measure. And that is, once again, false. That has led to... Uh, worldwide depletion of shark populations. There's also ideas surrounding um, touch therapy. There's uh, prayer therapy that we do not have any type of evidence to support its use. There is some indication that utilizing uh, massage, utilizing uh, biofeedback, utilizing meditation can assist with reduction in stress signals. And by reduction in stress signals, I'm able to reduce some of the total level of stress that I'm feeling. And since we know that there is the linkage between stress and 
inflammation and immune response. By reducing the total amount of stress, I'm able to alleviate some of the inflammation and immunological uh, responses that are taking place. And because of the impact that both radiation and chemotherapy have on immune function, by reducing stress, I can partially alleviate some of the immunological issues that might come about during uh, treatment of cancers. But once again, this is not the indication that those therapies are going to be curative. We can use massage therapy. We can use meditation as a means to uh, assist with the other uh, treatments that are being used within the totality of cancer treatments, which is why when we start looking at the way in which we treat cancers nowadays, it becomes more of what's referred to as an integrative oncology treatment. That's we're going to integrate various types of medical treatments within the uh, care of the person with cancer, where we're not just going to give them chemotherapy. We're not going to just give them radiation. There'll be uh, physical therapists involved. There'll be nutritionists involved, dietitians involved in the overall care of of the patient. There will be uh, counselors involved to help with the psychology of the issue, which leads to the the bigger picture in terms of this uh, care that we can look at, and that's diet and nutrition. While diet can have uh, deleterious effects in terms of exposure to uh, carcinogenic, immunogenic agents, appropriate diet during cancer treatments is essential. And this is where having a a registered dietitian within the integrated oncology within the the treatment team becomes very important for for the person the registered dietitian is going to help with ensuring that appropriate uh, nutrition is established the problem is is that a lot of the uh, Guys and ideas that are going to be followed within this is based off of the fact that you're going to be expending additional energy in terms of the treatment. And so it's all going to be about quote unquote calories, even though it's really about nutrients and making sure you get the appropriate level of nutrients necessary in order to allow for tissues that you want to maintain be maintained while still meeting energetic demands and allowing for the medicines to combat. The the cancers, and so we start looking at uh, dietary modifications and dietary uh, integration into the overall oncology in an integrated oncology treatment method. We're going to have to look at it not just in terms of the the energy, but also the nutrient balance. And within this idea, as looks at with nutrient balance, just like with everything else that I've been discussing in terms of diet for quite some time now, the nutrient balance becomes important. What we want to do is we want to make sure that we are increasing protein intake, increasing fat intake, increasing carbohydrate intake. It might sound kind of off-putting in terms of, oh, I'm eating more and I'm going to be quote unquote getting fat, but it's not that. And so if we think about nutrient balance under normal conditions, overconsuming nutrients can lead to weight gain. But when we're looking at in terms of cancer treatments, what we're doing is we're trying to offset any of the wasting that can take place due to the side effects of either radiation, chemotherapy, or the general stress that can come about from the cancer. And so one of the big things that we want to make sure that we're doing is increasing the protein intake in particular mainly to offset any type of uh, fat-free mass wasting that can occur. And we'll get to a second part of that idea here with exercise in a second. This is where we're going to be consuming protein at the higher levels of the ranges that we normally talk about. This is where we're going to be up in that 2.5, 2.7, almost 3 grams per kilogram of body mass in terms of what we're looking at, in terms of how much protein to consume within the day. Or if you want to look at in terms of grams per pound, that's about 1.15 to about uh, 1.5. So we're looking at about 1.15 to about 1.5. So 1.15 to 1.50 grams per pound of uh, body mass in terms of the amount of protein that you should be consuming in in a day. And that's just kind of a, a rough guide. We want to make sure that 
Carbohydrates are being consumed in excess of the 120 grams per day. That is the bare minimum that's necessary. You want to make sure that you're consuming the omega-3s and the omega-6s of your fatty acids, but not neglecting the consumption of the saturated fats and making sure that your ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s stays relatively consistent in terms of the 6 to 1 ratio that we typically look at in terms of omega-6s to omega-3s. In terms of the types of foods that you want to eat, you want to make sure that you're looking at trying to reduce stress levels, which means that you want to use foods that are going to help with providing the nutrients necessary to minimize the amount of cortisol responses we might get within a day, but also lead to a general appeasement psychologically. That is, you're eating comfort foods or you're eating foods that you want to eat. But at the same time, you're going to be eating foods quite often or eating foods at higher uh, rates than what you would normally eat. And the reason for this is because you want to make sure you're getting enough nutrients in order to maintain the nutrient balance that you're going to need, given the various stresses that you're going to have placed on the body. But what you're not going to want to do is you're not going to want to fall into any of the fad diets that are out there in terms of, oh, I'm going to uh, do uh, just keto, or I'm going to do vegan, or I'm going to do any of the other uh, fads that we typically think about when we start thinking about diet and nutrition. There is no uh, such thing as like a cancer diet. The idea here is to make sure that you are consuming high amounts of protein, high amounts of carbohydrates, high amounts of fats, trying to minimize the total amount of uh, refined processed foods that you're consuming, trying to make sure that if you are consuming uh, Grains, you're consuming whole grains so that you make sure you get all of the vitamins and minerals that you need, which takes us into the other thing you want to make sure you're getting within your nutrients is you're making sure you're eating rainbows. So you're making sure you're getting various colored foods within the foods that you're eating so that you are um, getting all of the vitamins and nutrients that you need. Supplementing that with additional uh, vitamin supplements simply because the bioavailability can be impacted by the medicines that are that are used in cancer treatments, which takes us into the uh, next part, which is going to be kind of under the guise of the physical therapist. But for people who are going to be outpatients, uh, you won't be just with the physical therapist, but you can also be possibly with the personal trainer or working out on your own, and that's exercise or physical activity. The general consensus that we see is that those who are more physically active tend to have better outcomes from the cancer treatments. The other thing we see in terms of the physical activity is that those who are more physically active tend to have lower relative risks for developing cancers if exposed to the various types of carcinogenic and mutagenic agents that we might see within diet, simply because of what physical activity does as it relates to changes in metabolic dysregulation and possible endocrine disruption that can come from the exposures that we see to the various substances that can raise the risk for cancer development. But we'll leave that for a different story. Let's talk about physical activity and exercise as it relates to uh, oncology treatments that we can see where we're going to integrate nutrition with exercises along with the other types of cares that we can use to reduce stress. Physical activity that we're looking at here is not going to be just simply getting up and moving, even though that tends to be a lot of the general recommendation that's given. There are two things that we want to make sure that we're integrating within the exercise. Yes, we want to make sure that we keep cardiorespiratory health. Yes, we want to make sure that we keep aerobic fitness. That is going to be one of the keys that we have in terms of maintaining the tissues we want to maintain, maintaining our abilities to stay relatively independent within the environment. But just like when we look at what should we do for aging populations, and what should we do for people who have been highly sedentary, those people who have been over fat? What we want to make sure that we're doing is we're integrating resistance exercise into the exercise selections that we're doing. Exercise selection in terms of the uh, resistance exercise should be done in levels based off of the consensus that we see that is appropriate to hypertrophy of tissues. That is high. Resistance exercise that would lead to an increase of skeletal muscle, an increase of bone. That is going to lead to or allow for 
proper amounts of bone strength, proper amounts of muscle strength to allow for independent movement in the environment. When we're looking at selection of exercise, utilizing exercise selection that is going to lead to independent limb movement. That is, I'm going to utilize a lot of dumbbells. I'm going to utilize a lot of resistance bands that is going to focus on moving one arm independent of the other arm, moving one leg independent of the other leg, where I am integrating a lot of balance within the uh, resistance exercise that's being done. By integrating a lot of these independent movements, what we're able to do is we're able to increase the uh, neural drive, the actual um, nervous system recruitment that's necessary in order to get the limbs to move. But at the same time, it's going to increase my need for stabilization. And by increasing my need for stabilization, increasing the independence of limb movement, I'm going to make sure that I am able to keep my body in postures that prevent falls. And by preventing falls, I'm able to make sure that I'm independent for longer periods of time. Now, with that in mind, we have to make sure that the exercise treatments, particularly the resistance training exercise treatments, are going to match capabilities of the person. So we're not going to ask people to do excessive levels of load in the resistance exercise. We're not going to ask people to do excessively complex movements in the exercise. But we're going to make sure that we're still overloading, but we're going to be overloading and utilizing a method of undulating periodization where we're going to match load to level of fatigue on the day, level of nutrient load on the day, that was my, that is what's my nutrient balance going to be, as well as what is the time relative to care. That is, if I am undergoing radiation that day, if I'm undergoing chemotherapy that day, I'm not going to be doing excessive levels of uh, weights. I'm not going to be doing a lot of resistance training, whereas doing a lot of body weight movements, a lot of endurance movements might be more uh, palatable, matching what is the exercise intensity? What is the exercise volume relative to what capacity do I have for that day? Now, in terms of exercises, yes, we want to do independent limb movements, but we also want to make sure we're doing large movements. We want to make sure that we're pulling in multiple uh, joints, multiple muscles within the various movements that we're doing. By pulling in multiple muscles, pulling in multiple joints, within the, the resistance exercise that we're doing, we're going to make sure that we're going to stimulate a, a hormone response following the exercise that's going to lead to tissue growth. It's going to hopefully maximize tissue growth under the conditions that we have, as long as we have the nutrient balance there to help us out. What's going to do is it's going to trigger the anabolic hormones to be produced. But the other thing I want to do within my exercise, I want to make sure that I am able to combat any of the negative fatigue issues that can come about from the side effects of the treatments that are um, from the side effects of the treatments that I might see. So we know that with like with radiation and with chemotherapy, fatigue is one of the side effects. And so what I want to do, and this is where improving my cardiorespiratory fitness, improving my aerobic fitness while undergoing care is of benefit. One of the consensus that we see is that increasing aerobic fitness leads to a reduction in fatigue for the individuals in cancer treatments. It also leads to an improvement in quality of life. That improvement in quality of life is seen with a reduction in uh, various types of anxiety and various types of depression that uh, cancer patients might experience, simply because by having vigorous physical activity, and doing vis vigorous physical activity with others leads to uh, a reduction in stress levels. If I'm able to do my exercise in group settings, particularly with other individuals who might also be undergoing types of cancer treatments, it gives me uh, a group camaraderie sense. It gives me a uh, network, a social network upon which I can rely upon that's going to know what I'm going through, that's going to help with the stress and anxiety that I might exhibit because of the cancer and because of the cancer treatment. We know that if I am doing a resistance training exercise, resistance training exercise that is going to uh, 
improve my strength in my in my legs, my balance. It's going to allow me to be more independent within the environment, which is going to once again reduce my level of stress, my level of anxiety, because I don't I won't have that intrinsic sense that I am reliant upon others. I can get myself out of bed. I can get myself off the couch. I can move into the bathroom. I can open fridges. I can move stuff around with a relative ease. It won't be the same relative ease that I had before cancer treatment, but it will still be relative ease. One of the things that we see within the uh, body of work as relates to both diet as well as exercise in cancer treatments is a general reduction in risk of recurrence, as well as a reduction in mortality for specific types of cancers. Now, we can't use this across all cancers. However, we can use it for certain cancers. For men who have had prostate cancer, there is a uh, reduction of approximately 40% in terms of the mortality risk from prostate cancer. For those who are physically active, at the point of diagnosis, and for those who continue to be physically active during treatment. We see similar numbers in similar percentages for women with breast cancer, particularly uh, for those who are physically active and those who are uh, physically active during treatment. We see a reduction in secondary effects coming away from treatments for breast cancer, which includes frozen shoulder issues, as well as reduction in mobility of the upper extremity, as well as reduction in generalized pain around the areas of extraction. Well, thanks for uh, listening. This was a long one, I know. Um, Hopefully you got a little bit out of the discussion. Please make sure that you are following everything that we're putting out there on uh, the podcast here, on YouTube, as well as in Substacks. If you have any specific questions, please make sure you're reaching out to the organizations that I have linked within the notes for this episode within the caption. If you want us to address specific topics, that you want to know more about in terms of education as relates to what we're doing here on the podcast, please make sure you're leaving those as well. Thanks again.